Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation to share with you the work that we have been doing since March on using data science to fight against COVID-19 in Spain. Of course, my life before uh, March wasn't about COVID-19, like I imagine the life for all of us. I was really focused on ELIS, the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligence Systems, which is a network of excellence connecting right now uh, 30 units in uh, 14 different countries in Europe and Israel uh, with a goal of contributing to making Europe excellent and an attractive place for European scientists to stay working on machine learning and related topics. And in particular, I, I have been very involved in creating an ELIS unit in Alicante, Spain, called the Institute of Humanity-Centric AI and working on three topics, the development uh, the um, computational modeling of human individual and aggregate behavior using machine learning techniques, the development of intelligent interactive systems with a particular focus on mobile systems and personal assistance, and then tackling the limitations and risks of today's AI-based decision-making systems, such as algorithmic discrimination, opacity, lack of veracity, subliminal manipulation of human behavior, or um, the computational violations of privacy. But then, of course, COVID-19 happened. Spain has been one of the worst affected countries and still is in the world. And having had worked on the use of data through um, an allies with machine learning techniques for social good, and particularly in the context of pandemics, I felt really motivated to creating a team of experts working on this and trying to help um, the government uh, make better decisions. So I made the pitch to the Spanish government and to the Valencian government, and the Valencian government was very interested in this. And then since March, I've been leading uh, a team of 20 plus scientists working on four areas. Before I explain what we work on, there's actually quite a number of challenges in creating such a team. It would, think why aren't there more teams like these supporting policymakers in making decisions. And the reality is that you know there are challenges related to capacity, awareness, and lack of a digital mindset in a lot of public administrations. There are limitations in just access into access to relevant data. There are of course concerns about privacy and data protection if the data uh, is personal or could or from the data we could infer personal attributes. There is usually a gap between where research results are and where the real world is, and closing that gap is always a challenge. And then in the context of the pandemic, there is also the additional challenge of not having um, uh, the systems ready for immediate organized action. So we actually um, been working on this since March, and perhaps because it's not so easy to create such a team, we got some international visibility, for example, in Politico or in MSNBC. And what is it that we are doing? So on the one hand, we have different data sources. We have mobile data, we have health data, we can have data coming from other uh, sensors or surveys. And then on the other hand, we have policymakers and decision makers, and they would like to make decisions that are based on evidence. Um, understanding the evidence as being reflected by the data. So the role of our team is to close this gap that there is in the middle between where the data is and where the policymakers are. And to close the gap, we decided to work on four areas. The first one is modeling large-scale human mobility because human mobility is key in the transmission of an infectious disease such as COVID-19. The second area is building computational epidemiological models that would enable us not only to predict how the pandemic is going to evolve over time, but also to run simulations on what would happen if, for example, there was less mobility. What would happen if we were doing contact tracing to 60% of the population and so forth. The third area is based on more sort of like machine learning based predictive models on number of intensive care units needed and hospitalizations and deaths and so forth. And the fourth area is um, a very large citizen science project via a very large online anonymous survey called the COVID-19 Impact Survey, which I actually invite all of you to answer after my talk. It only takes four minutes. But even 
with all this work, there is still a gap between where the outputs of all these um, teams are and where the policymakers are. So in the team, we have a full-time uh, director general working in the president of the region's cabinet, and she's come to all the meetings. She's worked uh, with us constantly. And together with me, we've been working on the interpretation of the results and the preparation and sort of like the translation of the results into a language that could be helpful and useful to policymakers. In terms of the team, uh, everyone is a scientist, a professor, from the research community in the Valencian region. And depending on the area, some people have more expertise on a spatial temporal data visualization or on machine learning or on modeling, depending on the team. These are the names of the people. It's a pretty large team covering different universities and research centers. And we've been working really hard in a very agile way. I organize meetings every day. Uh, until June, we will be meeting every day, and I made a report every day. We share, um, we have a common repository on GitHub, and we, of course, everyone has signed uh, in the necessary NDAs and code of ethics, and we use Slack for team communication. This is an example of one meeting uh, back, I guess, in March or April. We also have a website if you are interested, but it's, uh, I think it's uh, all uh, in Spanish uh, uh, or Valencian right now. So what is it that we're working on? So I'm gonna, I wanted to quickly give you an overview of some of the results and projects that we've done in each of the areas. The first one is the mo mobility um, data analysis. And the main questions that we wanted to answer were um, if the contention measures that the government implemented in March were working or not, what kind of mobility was reduced, was that reduction in mobility enough to contain the pandemic, and so forth. In terms of the uh, temporal granularity, we had access to daily data coming from the mobile network infrastructure through a collaboration with the Spanish National Institute of Statistics, who in turn had a collaboration with the three largest telcos in Spain. So through these collaborations, we were able to access aggregated, anonymized, large-scale human mobility data. And then in terms of the spatial granularity, the data was coming, uh, I'll show you later, on some cells that were defined by the National Office of Statistics, but we also did different spatial aggregations on different granularities from the province level to the health uh, zone level and the health department level, which were the meaningful units for the policymakers. This is some visualization of the mobility uh, in March in the region. This is the east of Spain. The Valencian region is in the east of Spain. And this is a summary of some of the findings. So in terms of the radius of gyration, which is the radius of the circumference that covers most of the daily trips from people, we found a very significant reduction of this radius during the confinement period in March and April in Spain, where there was a reduction of 65%, meaning that if before confinement the radius was 10 kilometers, on average for the population during confinement was only 3.5 kilometers. We also analyzed the success of a campaign that the government launched called the Stay at Home Campaign, which was a campaign aimed to encouraging people not to leave their homes. Here, home means these uh, areas that, are, that appear on the map, which are the, the cells, the areas that were defined by the Spanish Office of Statistics. What the map shows is the percentage of people that didn't leave this area uh, during the day, and for whom this area is the area where they sleep. So we call that their home area, and this uh, represents the percentage of people that live, didn't leave the area. The greener the color, the higher the percentage of people who didn't leave the area. So we see that there are regions with a dark green where in the upper 90s um, the, of the population didn't leave the area, and then some regions like the lighter green, maybe it was in the upper 70s, but it's still it's very high compliance of the stay at home campaign. Um, we actually have a website which is interactive and that enables you to look at all the data and play with it and look at all the different uh, variables and results that I'll explain next. This is a visualization of the stay at home campaign throughout the month of April and since mid-March to the end of April, which was the core of the confinement in Spain. And we can see that Sundays are days where particularly people really stay home, but during the period where there was no labor mobility, which was uh, the first 
the which was um, the first week of April uh, and this line here, uh, we see that there was a lot of compliance and people not going to work. We also analyzed the data per Department of Health in the Valencian region. There are uh, 24 departments of health just to see if we observe that some departments of health maybe were less compliant than others and what was the impact on the progression of the disease. When we looked at labor mobility, we uh, uh, observed that there was a, uh, also a significant uh, decrease in the labor mobility. In this image, what we show is the percentage of fewer people that were outside of their area of residence during working hours, meaning that they were probably working somewhere else, when we compare them to a baseline day in November. We always compared uh, with a normal day taken in November before the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we see here is the greener the color, the larger the drop in labor mobility, but we find that on average, uh, roughly 60% of there were fewer, there were 60% fewer people outside of their area of residence during the confinement period that when compared to a um, normal day in November. Uh, these are some visualizations of the activity levels. This was on March 24th when there was labor mobility. So we find that there isn't a, a lot of green uh, yet. And this is the uh, week of April 3rd when there was actually a contention of labor mobility and only essential services workers could actually leave for work. And then we find that you know there was a very significant drop in labor mobility. This is the same representation, but by the different departments of health. And using this uh, um, mobile data, we um, applied to different community detection algorithms to identify self-contained regions, regions that had a lot of inner mobility, but that didn't have a lot of mobility across regions. And this is important because if you're going to confine a region that is very self-contained, it doesn't, it probably is not gonna affect the lives of people because if all they do is move within themselves, that's not gonna have a lot of impact, but also it might not have a lot of impact in the pandemic either because people you know, move a lot inside but not that much across regions. And we identified um, uh, 14 different um, self-contained regions that were even crossing borders uh, from the perspective of the mobility. And uh, we thought that this was an interesting analysis that could be meaningful to the policymakers. We also analyzed the impact on tourism because this region is very touristy and we found a very significant drop in tourism activity, even in the early times of the pandemic. The second team is working on epidemiological models and we have developed two types of models meta-population models and individual models. In both cases, what we want to is be able to um, not only predict how, how the pandemic is gonna evolve, but also how it would evolve under different scenarios and situations. And also in, include the mobility and determine whether the reduction in mobility is enough or not to contain the pandemic. So the first type of models that we've developed are meta-population models and particularly SEIR models, which are state of the art in metapopulation models. And they divide the population into four states. The susceptible state, which is anyone that is susceptible to getting the disease. The exposed state, which are the people that have been exposed to someone that is infected. Then the infectious space, state, which are the people that are infected with the disease. And then the recover state, which could be either people that, de that died from the disease or people who recovered. For the transition, between one state to the next is given by these parameters that have already been estimated for COVID-19 and the dynamic system is given by these equations. We have expanded the system to include a probabilistic uh, approach and also to include the mobility of the population. And using this, we've been able to do pretty accurate predictions of the number of cases. The blue is the real number of reported cases and the orange is our predictions using this model. We've also developed an individual-based model, an agent-based model that models each individual in the population and using the same parameters for the probability of being infected and being exposed and so forth, you can also run simulations in this population. And uh, we've been running in parallel both models and computing predictions by both models to have a sort of like a way to, a most robust way to understand in which range, you know, our predictions were going to be. Using these models, we run different scenarios from doing nothing to having the actual 
measures that were implemented, which were pretty tough confinement measures. And according to the models, uh, there was a very significant reduction in the number of cases and also in the estimated deaths uh, due to the contention measures. The third uh, team is working on predictive models. And here we've been building mainly uh, daily predictions on the number of hospitalized, the number of intensive care units, the number of deaths using different time series predictions, prediction approaches. And finally, on March 28th, we launched a really large scale citizen science project through the COVID-19 impact survey. The reason why we launched this survey is because there were very important questions that we wanted to answer during the confinement that we didn't have the data for and that we couldn't answer. For example, what is the social contact behavior of people during confinement? What is the impact, the economic impact, the labor impact, the emotional impact that this confinement is having on people? How much longer are people going to be able to stay in confinement? Are there tests? One of the questions that we had was the, the or one of the suspicions was there was a very uh, a significant lack of testing availability at the beginning of the pandemic. What is the actual prevalence of the disease? Because there weren't enough tests, there weren't enough people being tested. So it was very difficult to know how many people were actually sick. So thanks to this survey, we've been able to answer all these questions throughout all these weeks. The survey has been translated to many languages and actually if any of you is interested in translating it to more languages, please let me know. It became vital in the first 44 hours since we launched it. And this is a representation of the number of answers in the first two days since we launched it, actually less than two days. And as you see, at the peak, we had over 15,000 answers in one hour. And um, being very grateful to citizens for their generosity and for their massive response to the survey, but also feeling responsible to share the findings. We work really hard on producing results from the analysis of this first set of answers. And we actually just published this JMIR paper that actually shares the data with anyone and also the results uh, from the analysis of the data. This was the data for what we call the first wave of the study, which was the last days of March until April 3rd, I think it was. Finding so much value in the survey, we decided to leave it open. So it's still open and we analyze the data weekly and we are now on week 25. You can actually look at all the data on this website and select the country. We have data for different countries and you can also play a little bit with the results that we got so far. So what are the results? I just wanted to give you a gist of some of them because I don't have the time to explain them all. When we look at the emotional impact over time, what we find is that um, there has been very significant emotional impact, particularly very significant reported uh, levels of stress, anxiety, loneliness, and sadness, um, even now, even 25 weeks later. We also find significant uh, abusive use of technology, both in children and in adults. One key question that we wanted to answer um, back uh, at the end of March, beginning of April, was how many people are they really infected? How far are we from reaching herd immunity? Herd immunity is the phenomenon whereby a very large percentage of the population has already been infected with an infectious disease, and therefore there aren't enough people to infect anymore or susceptible to being infected, and hence there is no pandemic anymore, right? So we were thinking, well, if we were close to herd immunity, then there wouldn't be a second wave of the pandemic because, you know, we've already been infected. So we wanted to be able to answer that question. And to do that, we actually built a generalized linear model that was using as input data, gender, age, and then the self-report symptoms, that is one of the questions in the survey, and also if there was a member of the household infected, which was another question in the survey. And we validated our model with a set of prevalence study that was done in Spain a month later. And we actually were quite impressed that we got pretty accurate estimations of the prevalence of the disease. So we think that running online population surveys is a great tool to be able to not only understand the situation and the perception of the uh, of citizens or of people during the pandemic, but even to infer the prevalence of the disease. We also run two parallel methods to infer prevalence. One, the, uh, the second method was based on the deaths to explain 
the deaths that we observe, how many people will have to be infected, knowing the death rate attributed to COVID-19. And we got estimations that were really at par with the set of prevalence study. And then we also use our own epidemiological model because our model has an underlying number of estimated infected people, which is much larger than the actual number of reported people. This gap was the gap in testing and in detecting asymptomatic. So according to our model, according to all these three models, for our region, the Valencian region, we estimated between two to 3% of the population. So really far away from herd immunity, which typically requires 65% of the population. So very early on, we knew that there was a very high risk of a second wave, which we are actually experiencing right now in Spain. Um, after we reached the peak, which was reached at the beginning of April, we did, we focused obviously not so much on the peak because I was already there, but you know, on what would we need to do to prevent a second peak or minimize the impact of a second peak. And one of the analysis that we did was what would happen if we leave the contention measures. And according to our models, if we leave the contention measures and did nothing else, there would be a second wave, which is what is happening right now. We also did an analysis on the impact of contact tracing. Um, to understand if we really needed to trace 100% of the contacts of every infected case, or if maybe only tracing 50% was enough. And according to our model, even just tracing 40 to 50% of the contacts, of the close contacts, was actually having a very uh, significant impact on reducing um, the impact of the second wave. This would be doing nothing, and this would actually be doing 50%, uh, 40% and 50% of the contacts being traced. And then we've done a lot of work on the emotional impact, individual protection measures taken by, pe by people, ability to put themselves in quarantine, testing uh, ability and contact tracing uh, efficacy. And I just wanted to share very quickly some of the results. One of the biggest findings is that the youth, people aged between 18 to 29, are the ones that report the biggest emotional impact of the pandemic. They are the ones, there's the orange uh, bar here, and they are the ones that report the highest level of levels of stress, compare that to the other uh, age ranges, the highest levels of anxiety, even loneliness and sadness are the highest levels for the youth, together with the highest abusive use of technology. So this is very important, I think, for us to know, and I think uh, maybe for programs to be developed to really focus on the youth. There is also a uh, gender difference. So in terms of the emotional impact, uh, women systematically report larger levels of anxiety, stress, sadness, uh, and every, uh, every, uh, every impact except for drug abuse and alcohol abuse compared to men. So young women in particular are the most affected. When we look at the willingness to stay in confinement over time, here we have the different weeks. We run the survey, and in different colors, we have the amount of time that people will be willing to stay in confinement, where the blue is zero days, the orange is one week, the gray is two weeks, the yellow is one month, the darker blue is three months, and then the green is six months. And what we see is that in March, very, very few people, very marginal people, said they couldn't be able to stay in confinement anymore. And the most popular answer was one month. And what we have observed over time is the number of people that say that they can't, they wouldn't be able to stay in confinement at all has grown a lot. It has multiplied itself by a lot. And the percentage of people that said that they could stay in one month has gone down a lot. So the willingness to stay in confinement, uh, or there is a sector of the population that really reports that they wouldn't be able to be in confinement anymore. When we look at the key factors that impact these very low levels of uh, or willingness to stay in confinement, we find that economic impact, emotional impact, and age are the biggest drivers to determine that you wouldn't be able to stay in confinement anymore. When looking at the perception of the government measures over time, something really peculiar has happened. This is again time on the x-axis, and then we have four lines that are telling us the perception that people had of the government measures, where yellow means the measures are too much, orange means I don't know, gray means the measures are enough, and then light blue means I demand more measures. And what we see is that until the end of June, which is when we reach in Spain what is called the new normality, um, roughly 40% of people demanded more measures and roughly 40% of people said that they were enough. 
And then progressively, since we reached this new normality and there was no con there was no contention measures anymore, we were not in a sterile alarm anymore. The percentage of people reporting that they wanted more measures has been going up monotonically, and the percentage of people reporting that the measures are enough have, has been going down monotonically. So this is an interesting finding. When we look at the professions that are the most impacted, we find that hospitality, entertainment, domestic service, transportation, construction, and commercial retail are the most affected professions, which has been corroborated also by other research. This is a very worrisome and interesting result. There is one question where we ask, would you be able to uh, self-isolate if you had to, because you had to be put in quarantine? And what this graph shows is the percentage of people that say that they would not be able to self-isolate from the end of April until the end of August. And what we see is that it's always been very high. It's always been around 40%, but it's really gone up, uh, up to almost 60% uh, lately. So a very significant percentage of the population reports that they wouldn't be able to isolate if they had to. So if we have a TTI strategy, trace, test, isolate, we cannot assume that everyone will be able to isolate because most people might not be able to isolate. When we look at the perception of different activities, what we wanted to understand was, do people think, is there a mismatch between how safe activities are and the perception of people? Safety from the perspective of risk of getting COVID-19. And I just wanted to highlight two interesting results. The first one is that schools and universities are not considered by a lot of people to be that safe. It's always been below 30%. Actually, it has started being 8% and it's going up progressively, but it's still below 30%. And the other worrisome figure perhaps is hospitals where roughly half of the people don't think that it's safe to go to the hospital because you have risk of getting COVID-19. When we look at the individual protection measures per gender, we find that women protect themselves more than men. Wearing masks and uh, disinfecting hands are the most popular measures that people do. And the least popular one is ensuring that there is ventilation in closed spaces, even though it's a very important measure to take, particularly now that, uh, you know, there is air conditioning in the summer or in the winter when there is heating, you know, and people don't open the windows. And then finally, I just wanted to um, um, share this result on contact tracing. So, we, uh, we, look, we ask people that report having had close contact with an infected individual if any contact tracer called them or not. And unfortunately, we find that the majority of people tell us that no one called them. So again, if we're doing a TTI strategy, trace, test, isolate, it seems that the trace part is also probably, you know, could be developed further because there seems to be a lot of people that are not being um, traced. So what have I learned? You know, I've said you all these results, but what are the main findings beyond the specific COVID-19 findings? So the biggest um, lesson for me is that public health problems depend not only on the healthcare system, depend on society as a whole. And we really need to have this holistic approach to it. We cannot just focus on the individual problems. We have to look at all the dimensions, you know, together. So to me, if we really want to tackle this pandemic. We have these three pillars that we need to develop in parallel. First of all, we need to um, really have access to high quality data that is captured in a systematic way and that is analyzed in a systematic way. Data that will enable us to understand where we are how we got where we got, what is working, what is not working, are the measures working, and also make predictions about where we're going. The second pillar is people and technology. I think we really need to invest on the necessary people, the necessary contact tracers, the necessary teachers, the necessary researchers, you know, healthcare and social services personnel, but also they need to have access to state-of-the-art technology to be able to do their job, you know, in a proper way. And finally, I really think that it's important to um, using the data and the people and the technologies, design public policies and specific processes that address weaknesses identified in the system. For example, what I mentioned about the quarantine or what I mentioned about the youth or you know what we know about the vulnerable uh, uh, people uh, and how important it is to protect them. So I think developing these three pillars is what would enable us to have a sustainable model to be able to coexist 
with uh, a COVID uh, to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, to, with the coronavirus, you know, in a sustainable way that is also manageable from a social perspective. So just to conclude, I wanted to share with you this experience of having experts and citizens working together with public officials as a way to contribute to this new way of making decisions that will be more evidence and knowledge driven. And hopefully it will be a more fair and more effective way of making decisions. Thank you so much. And again, I encourage you to uh, answer the survey, COVID-19 Impact Survey. Thank you.